Hello, and welcome to SoberCast, where we provide AA speaker meetings and workshops in podcast format. We're an ad-free podcast, and if you enjoy listening, please help us be self-supporting by visiting SoberCast.com, look for the donate link, and drop a dollar or two into our virtual basket. We hope you enjoy the podcast. Have a great day. My name's Rhubarb Jim, and I'm an alcoholic. (laughs) The Bethlehem Group is my home group. We meet on a Monday and a Friday night at 8 p.m., and you're, it's a speaker meeting, and you're welcome to come any time you're in town. I want to thank the Feet First group for asking me to speak here tonight. I've been coming to this speaker meeting now for a few months, and uh, it's getting to be a nice group. Uh, I want to remind uh, the alcoholics here that uh, if you don't have a home group, you're a homeless alcoholic. (laughs) And that there are plenty of groups that would be uh, pleased to have you as one of its members. Um, I'm about as nervous as anybody else is when they get up here in front of a crowd like this. Um, My home group is a large speaker meeting, and I've been speaking there. Uh, like once a year for several years now, but, you know, once a year doesn't really <clears throat> prepare you. And every time I get up here, I get nervous. And they tell me that's God's way of speak, uh, shaking the truth out of me. And I believe that. I uh, began my uh, journey in sobriety uh, back on May 9th, 1987. Uh, I was 50 years old when I got here, and uh, this is only my first time here. Uh, I was sponsored into the program of Alcoholics Anonymous. I sponsor other people in the program of Alcoholics Anonymous, and I'm here tonight looking for my next sponsor, because there's no guarantee that my current sponsor is going to live forever. There's also no guarantee that I'm going to stay sober. So uh, I'm looking for a good sponsor. And you're probably right here in this room. AA has no distinction, no separate class of alcoholics. There's no special uh, people in AA. There's no class of uh, people who are going to be exclusively the sponsors, and there are no special people who have to remain the beginners. We're equal. Everybody here is qualified to be a sponsor. We just haven't all arrived at the point where we're capable of doing that. And like other alcoholics, you know, I want the best. (laughs) And if you're going to be the best, I have to help you become that way. That's part of my responsibilities. You see, I have to pass it on for me to stay sober. I thank you for being here tonight because I know the benefits that I'm going to get out of this. And you need to learn that you can have the same kind of benefits. I, uh, <clears throat> excuse me, I began my drinking I think it was in 1938, and that's probably before most of you were born. (laughs) And I drank for 39 years. And I figure uh, if I can stay sober for another uh, 17 more years, I'll be even on my drinking years and my sober years. And I know with replacement parts, it's possible for me to do that. (laughs) So I'm very optimistic about Alcoholics Anonymous. Uh, I've been able to do things and go places and experience um, a good life, sober, that I never expected that I would see. Alcoholics Anonymous has been good to me. And if you follow the same program that I was given, which is found in the book called Alcoholics Anonymous, you can have the same kind of life ahead of you. 
My past was not too good. <clears throat> I didn't particularly like it. <clears throat> but when I got here, they told me that I could build a new future. And my future looked pretty bleak at the time. So I wanted what you people were freely given away. I was given a book uh, called Alcoholics Anonymous. And uh, I thought... Well, it can't be worth very much if they're giving it away. <laughs> and little did I know it was worth more than my life itself. <clears throat> and I say it's worth more than my life itself because it not only saved my life, it made it possible for me to help save other people's lives. Other alcoholics, just like me, who came in here sick and tired of being sick and tired, and found out I didn't have a social problem, but I had a true disease that uh, wasn't caused by that uh, woman that I was married to for many years. It had nothing to do with my family of origin. Uh, it was a true disease. And when I bought into the idea that it was a disease, it made a difference in my life. You see, I, if, uh, if, uh, if I had thought that I was an alcoholic because of something that my mother did or my brother did or my ex-wife did, I'd be doomed because I couldn't get them to undo it, you see. And then my sobriety would depend on somebody else. And my sobriety depends on me. And my belief and my relationship to a power greater than myself. And nobody can deny me that. Alcoholics Anonymous gives it away to everyone that walks through this door. I am responsible when anyone, anywhere, reaches out for help. And when I reached out for help, there were people here to provide that help. The question was, would I want it? See, I was one of those independent thinkers when I was drinking who didn't need anybody. I knew it all. I could do it all. I was very talented, thank you. And uh, <clears throat> if there was something I didn't know, it probably wasn't worth knowing. <laughs> And uh, I came here to Alcoholics Anonymous, and my sponsor began to explain things to me uh, so that even I could understand them. Uh, he began to tell me that uh, in addition to my alcoholism, uh, I had something called character defects. And I didn't particularly believe him. But he told me if I didn't have any character defects, I'd have nothing to change. And if I had nothing to change, I was doomed to stay the same person, and the same person was going to drink again. So I'd better find some character defects. <laughs> Something that I could change. <laughs> change has been a vital part of my recovery. Uh, things that are vital are necessary for life. And uh, that's a word I discovered in the big book. You know, I'd read past it right away and, and think nothing of it. And, and uh, it took somebody like my sponsor to point these things out to me, to slow me down enough to really pay attention. <sighs> Sobriety's in the fine print. You know? Uh... The wall charts that are usually hanging here <laughs> are only a summary of the steps. They're a summary. They're not the steps themselves. And they're only suggested. But I didn't see any second suggestion. It's the only suggestion we have. 
I thought that was annoying too. <laughs> so my next sponsor will have to uh, uh, find these things out and and believe it. I uh, I had one of those uh, rehab experiences. It was a 28 day rehab that they used to have uh, 20 years ago. And uh, it was a couple of days of detox that I don't really remember. <clears throat> and uh, I was the only one there that uh, liked the food. <laughs> and the reason I liked the food is because I was extremely malnourished. And uh, I had what is known as scurvy. It's a vitamin deficiency. And one of the... One of the uh, <clears throat> The characteristics of that disease in, in me was that I lost my sense of taste and my sense of smell. <clears throat> so when I was drinking and sitting in the bar room and having uh, a supper of uh, pickled eggs and uh, Slim Jims, <laughs> uh, I wasn't getting much vitamin D or vitamin C. And uh, if I was getting those water-soluble vitamins, uh, the beer was taking them right out of my body. And uh, I uh, couldn't understand what was happening to me. I kept getting worse and worse. I would go to a restaurant for lunch. I was working a middle shift at the time. Um, and I'd go to a restaurant uh, for lunch before I went into work. And I'd just push the, the food around on my plate a little bit and order another uh, mixed drink and, and walk away and go to work. And little by little, <clears throat> the uh, the malnourishment and the effects of the alcohol in my brain uh, did the job that, that happens to a lot of alcoholics. When I got to that rehab uh, and they gave me some vitamin shots, uh, my sense of taste came back. And uh, <laughs> I was pretty well, uh, I guess they call it mocus in New, in New York. Uh, I was kind of foggy. And it took 18 months before I could become employed. Um, and during that time, when I got out of the rehab, I, I came to AA on a regular basis. And not working, I could go to as many meetings as I wanted to. But in the beginning, I had to set my alarm clock to uh, ring for the 7.30 meetings. Otherwise, I'd just sit there and not realize it was 7.30 and then I'd miss my meeting. And uh, so I'd set the alarm clock to go to a meeting. And when I'd get there, the people uh, were aware of what was going on with me more than I was. Uh, they'd ask me if I had eaten anything that day. And I'd say, geez, I don't remember. And they say, well, go home and look in the sink. <laughs> and if there's dirty dishes in there, you must have eaten something. And then wash the dishes. <laughs> and that used to get me angry. <laughs> yeah. But uh, they cared, which was important. Uh, one day I went out in my backyard. Uh, times were tough, and, and uh, I was trying to stretch... Uh, what little money I had, I'd go to the store and I'd buy a bag of damaged produce and I'd buy a pound of hamburger and I'd try and make uh, some kind of soup, vegetable soup with, with a quarter pound of hamburger in it for each day uh, because I didn't want to uh, fall back into scurvy again. So uh, some days it didn't go very far. And uh, I went out in my backyard. I, I One time I had a big garden, and I was looking to see if there was anything out there that I could uh, throw into the pot. And I found that I, my rhubarb was still out there. Uh, my mother lived in a high-rise for the elderly, and uh, she used to ask me to bring her some rhubarb. And no matter how much rhubarb I brought her, she always wanted more. 
So I had a lot of rhubarb out in that backyard. <laughs> and when I discovered the rhubarb was there, I thought, oh, God is good. Now I can fill up the whole pot. And uh, so I cut up some rhubarb and I threw it in with the other stuff that was in there already. And <laughs> it usually didn't taste good anyhow. <laughs> so I, I wasn't too concerned about whether it was going to taste good or not. And uh, But I went to my meeting that day. And I was so proud of myself, and before the meeting started, I got talking to some of the fellows about it. And there was one guy there who was a Lehigh dropout, Lehigh University dropout. He had, he had taken some chemistry courses like 40 years before this, and he tried to tell me that rhubarb was poisonous, that I couldn't eat it. And I said, well, you better tell that to all these Pennsylvania Dutch people around here who are eating strawberry rhubarb pie. So I said, it's not poisonous. And he and I got into a little discussion. And that's when I became rhubarb Jim. <laughs> <laughs> but, you know, I, I still had all my character defects and my pride and my ego uh, told me that I'll show these people. And I began to experiment to see what I could do with rhubarb. And eventually I discovered that if you cook the rhubarb into a sauce with just rhubarb and a little bit of water, and you cook it for a few minutes, it gets real mushy, and there's lots of strings in there. And if you take and put it in a blender, the strings are gone. And you end up with a product that has the same consistency as tomato paste or tomato sauce. Now, tomatoes are high in vitamin C, and they're very acidic. And rhubarb is high in vitamin C, and it's very acidic. So I said, well, why don't I do with rhubarb what everybody does with tomatoes? So I made a delicious, I mean delicious, rhubarb chili con carne. And I also made a very good rhubarb spaghetti sauce. And I was eating that stuff every week. And it got me through that 18-month period before I could get back into the workforce. You see, what I was doing is I was trying new things. I was being open-minded. And I was being encouraged to try new things and being open-minded by the people in Alcoholics Anonymous. You don't read about that in the big book so much. You get that from the fellowship. You get that from sponsorship. You get that from people who care. People who love us until we can start loving ourselves. You know, the big book by itself can get you sober. But the fellowship, sponsorship, someone who knows the program, someone who can take you through the steps, can do a good job quicker than you can do it on your own. I had uh, the usual kind of problems that other alcoholics had uh, because of my humanness. I had the same kind of character defects that non-alcoholics had. Uh, there's nothing special about us once we stop drinking. You know, my liver can't process alcohol, but my ego is just as sick as any other non-alcoholic's ego. We're not the only ones. You know, there's a special program for friends and relatives of alcoholics who don't have drinking problems. They call that Al-Anon. And as many of us alcoholics know, they're sicker than we are. <laughs> My wife was an Al-Anon before I was an alcoholic. I didn't think her father had that much of a problem. She heard that uh, alcohol makes your life unmanageable. And she was going to speed up the process. <laughs> we, had, uh, we had two sons and a daughter. The two sons were the oldest. Uh, at this occasion, uh, my oldest boy was in his second year of college, and my second son was in his first year of college. And it was summertime, and I got both of them jobs uh, working on a railroad. 
And my wife approached me and she says, you can't treat these kids the way you're treating them anymore. She says, uh, I won't have it. She says, from now on, you are going to cut the grass. You're not going to make these kids cut grass. I said, excuse me? <laughs> she says, they're not going to cut grass. I says, I cut the grass last week. It's David's turn this week and Michael's turn the week after. And I says, when, I, when they take their turn, then I'll take my turn. Well, several weeks went by and the grass didn't get cut. <laughs> the next thing I know, the uh, health inspector's there, and he's writing out a ticket or citation, whatever they call it. It's going to fine us for the weeds in the backyard. And I said, well, you know, you're in charge of the money. You pay it. <laughs> and uh, my oldest boy went and he borrowed a sigh. That's a big thing that you use to cut hay out in the fields. And he cut the cut the grass with a sigh. And then that incident disappeared. You know, uh, when I was drinking, there was very little that made my life unmanageable, <laughs> as long as I could get my drink. But uh, when I got into recovery, and the people in the meetings that I went to began to share their experiences with me, I began to see how unmanageable they were, and then recognized the same thing in myself. When I saw that you were selfish and self-centered, I began to understand that I, too, was selfish and self-centered. When I saw that you were dishonest and inconsiderate, I began to see that I also was dishonest and inconsiderate. But the good news was that I saw many of you were different. You weren't the relapsers that were kept going back out, kept coming in. You were, you were changing. And I didn't understand how that was happening, but I could see it. And my sponsor said, if you want to change, you're going to have to do what they did. And he says, they went through the steps. And you're going to have to go through the steps. And uh, I wasn't sure how that was done. And he uh, he asked me to give up some of my free time and meet with him, and we would start going through the book. And so we would begin to read from the book of Alcoholics Anonymous. And that's where I found out in the doctor's opinion that I truly have a disease. And I could see it in myself. And it was only by looking back in my past was I able to recognize the cravings that I had for alcohol that once I took that first drink, I could not stop. I just could not. And uh, it had been that way, I guess, right from the beginning. But in the beginning, um, I was more of a periodic drinker. I could go periods of time like a whole week without a drink, even two or three weeks if it was necessary, particularly when, when I was younger and newly married and raising children and, and, and trying to be a good father and a good husband and not wanting to waste what little resources we had on alcohol. Because at that point, Alcohol was not my primary purpose. But over the years, the disease progressed, whether I drank or not. But I drank every chance I got. And as uh, as I progressed in business world, and I earned more money, and money became then available for drinking, the drinking began to be more pronounced. <clears throat> And when I look back, I could see that. But, you know, when my wife was a good Al-Anon member putting pamphlets on my plate, <laughs> I didn't understand that. 
And my wife, by the way, she left four years before I came into recovery. And that freed me up to drink the way I could, the way I wanted to, the way that was killing me. You see, because alcohol was killing me. And uh, I didn't know that at the time. And it was only by the grace of God that I that I was put in that rehab because I had no job and I had no money and I had no health insurance. And Alcoholics Anonymous found me and rescued me when I didn't even know I had the problem. But I do have the problem. And I did want to do something about it. And so I was willing to shrink my ego. I didn't know that is what was happening at the time, but I was willing to do whatever it took. So, I had to look at this third step business, and when I came in, whenever they looked at the wall charts and they talked about the third step, they would bring up this old cliche about, well, a third step is making a decision that there's three frogs in a log and uh, and they decide to do something, uh, jump into the water. How many frogs are left? And the answer, of course, was three because they only made a decision. They didn't take any action. And that's all I knew about the third step because <laughs> that's all they talked about. And uh, nobody talked about the relationship that was necessary for me to enter into. And nobody talked about being God's agent and God's employee and God's child. And even when my sponsor began to explain those things to me, I had no idea what it meant to be an agent to anything. My uh, parents were divorced when I was quite young. I had no father figure in my house when I was growing up. Uh, so to me, to think about God as a father figure was rather difficult. Until I began to think of my experience as a father to my three children. And how they responded to me as a father. And then I could begin to understand if you have difficulties understanding the concepts of these, this relationship that we have to get into with a power greater than ourselves, ask. Ask somebody, anybody, how they handle it and what experiences they've had. You know, we don't talk about these things openly enough in public meetings because they're very personal matters. But without a complete understanding of where we should be heading, we're going to wander aimlessly. And uh, most alcoholics who have any kind of a spiritual arrangement uh, will probably share with you one-on-one -on -one what they will not feel comfortable sharing with you in public meetings. So don't be afraid to ask, and, and particularly your sponsor. That's what sponsors are there for. When it came uh, time to think of myself as uh, God's employee, I was okay, because I was a good employee. I wanted to be a good employee. How else was it going to get to be the boss? You know, I had to work hard so I could take the outfit over, you know, to be successful in life. So I knew how to be a good employee, but to be God's child, um, again, was a difficult area for me to uh, to journey into. Um, but I developed that later uh, through prayer and meditation. I developed that later as I journeyed through the steps as I went through 6 and 7, and I got into uh, Steps 9 particularly, uh, and began to experience the rewards 
of sobriety. You know, we hear a lot about the nine step promises. And they are wonderful. But there's promises in every step. And there's rewards in every step. And, and you don't have to wait until your ninth step to begin to have a good experience in Alcoholics Anonymous. Uh, things that are new to me are usually uncomfortable. And the third step was uncomfortable until I became comfortable. And the only way I was going to become comfortable was to keep on using it. And it really didn't take that much uh, hard work on my part because I'm only responsible for part of the relationship. And the guy on the other end of the relationship has more power than I have. So he can bring more to this relationship than I could offer. And at first I didn't trust him. I was afraid to ask. And if I did ask, I was afraid to look to see if I got what I was asking for. But you know, when I began to keep track of what I was praying for, because I was so worried that I was going to ask for something selfishly, and in the third step it, it advised me not to ask for anything unless somebody else would benefit from that. And, and, uh, so I would have to write out my prayers to make sure that, that I wasn't doing it wrong. Uh, and I started to keep those things. And little by little, I began to see that I was receiving things that I had asked about two or three weeks ago, or maybe just two or three days ago. And I began to see that I was receiving help. When I started to look for the relationship with myself and a higher power, I began to see what I was looking for. I began to realize that, you know, when I tried to get out of my street and the garbage trucks were there blocking me, it held me up long enough so that when I was up to that red light, which, by the way, was green, and about to go through there, a car went fly, flying through the other way. That had I been there two seconds earlier, I'd been a goner. Yeah. You know, that had to be the hand of God. <clears throat> to land me enough to keep me safe and protected. Yeah. You know, when I began to look for those kind of things, I began to see those kinds of things. The fourth step for me was, uh, ah, a dilemma um, because I began to uh, to see the truth about myself that I really didn't want to find but it was there and uh, I was selfish and self-centered and dishonest and inconsiderate and I had to find those things out you know that's the if you do one of those column things uh, that's in the last column uh, that's the last thing that we look for. That's the conclusion that I reached by taking my inventory, by looking at these people that I had resentments against, and then only looking at my part, you see, and finding out that I placed myself in this position because I wanted something. Now, maybe, maybe I was entitled to that, but usually I found out that I, even if I was entitled, I wanted more than my fair share. <laughs> you know? And when I would take my fair share, those people would try to get even. And sometimes it took them a long time. But they always got even when they could. And then I began to see, see, they're picking on me and I didn't even do nothing today. <laughs> and it was in the inventory process that I was able to think what happened last week or last month or a year ago and this is their first chance to get even 
seeing that I was selfish and self-centered and inconsiderate, uh, I was willing to ask God for help. You know, for me to enter into that relationship in step three, God had to accept me exactly the way I was, with all my character defects, whether I knew it or not, and he was offering me forgiveness before I knew it. Because he had to forgive me to accept me in that third step. For him to accept me with what I considered all my character defects, the forgiveness on his part had to come first. And it wasn't until I got to the sixth step that I was willing to ask him to help me be willing to get rid of a few of those. Most of those I was more than anxious to get rid of because I could see they caused me a lot of problems. I'd be glad to see them go. But there were a few things, not too many, a few things that I just needed help on that I liked and I wasn't willing to quite ready to give up yet. And so I asked God for that help and I went on with the seventh step and uh I must have been forgiven. And I began to realize that. And I I finished my uh actually I finished my fifth, sixth, seventh, all in the same day. You see, when it said go home for that one hour and review and make sure I left nothing out, I did. And then there's only two small paragraphs for six and seven. And having gone through that fifth step and having made sure I left nothing out, I was ready for six and seven. And, and where things were inching along before that, suddenly the program began to explode. And in the third step, it tells me that I have to do the rest of the steps with vigorous action. Vigorous action. And I began to see it was possible. So I I wrote out my A step, went back to the sponsor that did my fifth step with me, and I had him review that, and and Together we determined who was to stay on the list and who was to get off. Because I thought I had harmed everybody. And he began to show me that it was only my ego thinking I was that important. (laughs) So there were people that I didn't even make amends to. I wasn't that important. And there were also some things uh, I didn't want to see. And he says, uh, I remember you talked about this. I don't see anything on your list. And I had to put it on there. So, uh, little by little, little by little, I began to sleep well at night. You know, uh, that feeling of uselessness and self-pity began to disappear. I began to think of myself as a child of God. Of value. You know, I still wasn't of much value to this world. By God, I was 50 years old. I'd go for a job and they'd say, oh, you're overqualified. (laughs) So, uh, I got into the nine step process and uh, I began to reap some more rewards of the program. Uh, my mother was still alive. She uh, she was alive for nine years after I came into recovery. Um, if I ever went to a psychiatrist, he'd have a field day with me <laughs> and, and my mother. <laughs> Um, but I've never been to a psychiatrist. I've been to Alcoholics Anonymous. 
And they told me that uh, I needed to forgive the people that harmed me. And I love my mother. And until I took my inventory, I would not have said that my mother had harmed me in any way whatsoever. But that wasn't true. So making amends to my mother was a delicate proposition. Uh, I couldn't tell her uh, how she hurt me without destroying her. So I just made what they call a living amend. Um, my mother was getting up in age, and uh, I had been ignoring her for years. And so I began to become a dutiful son and go down and see how she was doing. And mom was starting to suffer from uh, loss of memory. I don't know whether you'd call it Alzheimer or not, but uh, she was on a lot of medications. And uh, I'd go down and I'd take her pill bottles and line them all up, and she had a container for every day of the week and I'd count out her pills and put the proper amount of pills in each container each day of the week. And uh, then I found out that just because I put them in there didn't mean she took them. <laughs> uh, you know, I'd go down and I'd open up these things and four days were still in there. Mom, why didn't you take these? Oh, I don't know. Oh, okay, Mom. So I began to start stopping in on my way home from work and and uh, looking in the container. If she took the pills, fine. If she didn't, I'd just go get a glass of water and say, Here, Mom, you forgot to take the pills and not make a big deal out of it. But uh, I began to feel good about our relationship. I... Uh, I lost those, uh, I guess they were like hidden resentments, uh, and I began <clears throat> to be happy to go see her on a regular basis. And when she finally passed away, <clears throat> I didn't have any uh, nightmares and I didn't have any uh, regrets. I had done my part. I had cleaned up my side of the street, and uh, it was a good experience. Uh, the other experience I had with death was with the death of my oldest child, my son. Uh, that was tough. He was a good kid. He was 42 years old, and he had uh, brain cancer. And he lingered for six months. He had two operations. He had every bit of chemotherapy that the government would allow a human being to have. And his physicians told him that he wasn't allowed to have any more radiation. And within a few weeks he died. Uh, God was with me through all that. I didn't drink. That's not a miracle. That's normal for people in the program of alcoholics about us. You know, I'm not special. And these kind of things happen to a lot of us. And worse. And worse. You don't have to drink no matter what if you're in fit spiritual condition. So being in fit spiritual condition or as close to it as I could get on any given day because I'm absolutely human and I'm certainly not perfect nor do I run a perfect program in Alcoholics Anonymous. I stay as close to it as I can. There are days when I forget to uh, do my prayer and meditation. There are days when I shortcut that thing called devotion 
which we don't often talk about. You know, we hear a lot of talk about prayer and meditation, but what about that word devotion? It's in the same step. And for me, devotion is the study of spiritual material. <clears throat> in uh, Dr. Bob and the Good Old Timers, Dr. Bob told us there were nine and a half pages of the Bible that he felt were essential. <clears throat> it's the book of James, which is only, I forget how many pages, four or five. Not too many. And the love chapter uh, from 1 Corinthians and the Sermon on the Mount, which is found in Matthew uh, 5, 6, and 7 or something like that. And that's it. And 50% of our original founders, the ones who wrote the big book, were either agnostic or atheist. And before they wrote the big book, they got up at the podium at their meeting and they read from the Bible. And even the atheist had to have information about spiritual terms. The best place at that time to learn about honesty and forgiveness and caring for other people was a Bible or other spiritual material. It doesn't, it could be the Koran. It doesn't have to be the New Testament. It could be, uh, you know, anybody's religious teachings uh, that have been tested through the ages. The Buddhist uh, and other religions in the Far East that I don't know anything about get sober in Alcoholics Anonymous today based on the spiritual teachings of their particular religion. I'm told that all religions have the same basic spiritual tools. And even if you're an atheist or a Gnostic, you need to find those tools and use them. Now, I'm not going to stand up here and say you absolutely have to have a God. In 22 years, I've seen two people say from a podium that they were uh, agnostics, not agnostics, atheists that they claim to be atheists and sober for long periods of time in the program of Alcoholics Anonymous. For me, it worked for me to be a believer. But what Alcoholics Anonymous gave me that my church uh, teachings did not give me was the concept that God was a power greater than I. You see, I used to tell God what he had to do. <laughs> And I was amazed when it didn't work. And I couldn't figure out why God was like that. Did you see Alcoholics Anonymous turn my thinking around? And when it turned my thinking around, uh, I began to act differently. And when I began to act differently, I began to get different results. If you're going to be my next sponsor... You're going to have to be able to convince me of exactly the same kinds of things that I was convinced of when I first came to Alcoholics Anonymous. Many people find it popular to say, well, I can't get anybody sober and I can't get anybody drunk. And that is 100% opposite of what the program of Alcoholics Anonymous tells us. If we couldn't get people sober, we might as well lock the doors and stop coming to meetings. Come to meetings because we have a message of recovery which can be transferred from one alcoholic to another. We can get people sober. If you've relapsed for 150 times, there's no reason why you can't get sober today and stay sober for the rest of your life. In the, somewhere in the front of the big book, there's a, in one of the forewords, it talks about 50% of the original members got sober and stayed sober for the rest of their life. 
Another 25% got sober and stayed sober after a relapse or two. That's 75%. Those are nice odds. And all that happened before they could read from the book of Alcoholics Anonymous, when they were reading from the Bible. Now, when the book Alcoholics Anonymous came, Clarence Snyder decided to start his own uh, meeting up in Akron, Ohio, so that they wouldn't have to travel back and forth, and a few other reasons. And they got the first copies of the book Alcoholics Anonymous, and they started the first meeting called Alcoholics Anonymous. They were not the first group. Akron was the first group. But the meeting in Cleveland was the first meeting to be called Alcoholics Anonymous because it was named after the book. And so, of the first 263 people that got sober in Cleveland, Ohio, 260 of them stayed sober for the rest of their life. Those are even better odds. And that happened with the book of Alcoholics Anonymous. I believe in Alcoholics Anonymous. I also believe in you. You're no different than I am. You're no better than I am, and you're no worse than I am. You're just at a different place in your life. We all travel the same road, not necessarily at the same speed, but we do it voluntarily. If you want what we have, you're going to have to do what we did to get what we got. And what we did more than anything else was pass it on to others. You've got to do that 12-step work. It's more important to be a sponsor than it is to have a sponsor. Thank you for letting me share. Thanks for listening. I hope you enjoyed the podcast. Sobercast is ad-free, and we'd like your help in order to keep it that way. So if you'd like to help us be self-supporting by pledging a dollar to a month, visit Sobercast.com and look for the donate links. Thank you very much.